Starting off with the Behavior Bureau, Tiffany Davis Henry, psychotherapist and HLN contributor, Wendy Walsh, psychologist and author of the 30 Day Love Detox, Dr. John Sharp, psychiatrist, faculty at Harvard University and author of The Emotional Calendar, and a special appearance, we welcome Candace Cameron Bure. Candace played DJ on the Full House program. She is an actress, producer, and author. First up, Samantha, I want to go to you to give us a report on what is the latest on Amanda. Well, Amanda Bynes' parents, Richard and Lynn, are deeply concerned for their daughter. So we are in day three since they have filed to obtain conservatorship of Amanda. And since then, the hearing will be now August 9th, okay? So in that hearing, until then, in the interim, the judge is going to carefully examine the case. And he said he's going to cross all his T's, he's going to dot all his I's, he's also going to hear from Amanda, because we do know that her involuntary 72-hour hold is now extended for the two weeks. Two week hold now. So this shows how severely mentally ill she is. She's gone from a three day hold where now she has relinquished all of her civil liberties. She is being held for 14 days. I'm of the opinion that the key to saving Amanda may be conservatorship. Her parents again applied for probate conservatorship, which is different than the usual probe conservatorship we apply for. It suggests she's complying to some extent. Again, a conservatorship is where somebody is able to get a professional or a family member to step in and take over financial affairs of that individual, sometimes require them to get treatment, sometimes take over the well-being of their body and their care on a daily basis. Now, in their bid for conservatorship, Amanda's parents itemized several okay. bizarre behaviors. Samantha, I know you've heard a lot about this, and these are all symptomatic of major mental illness. I suspect perhaps mania. Dr. Sharp, I'll have you comment on that in a second. She's homeless. She's paranoid. She was seen to be covering smoke alarms with towels and taping up windows and covering dashboards and whatnot. Two hit-and-run accidents, including a drunk driving arrest, suggest possibly a substance involvement here as well. She arrived from L.A. to New York, from, from New York to L.A. without any sort of notice. She says she cabbed here. She's been uncharacteristically hostile and with family members. She's been excessively spending $1.2 million spent yes. in just two months. Now, as I said, as you heard me saying in one of these tape pieces, these major mental illnesses like bipolar set in in the late teens and early 20s or mid-20s. Dr. Sharp, what are we seeing here? Do you agree this is probably major mental illness? Definitely, I do agree it's major mental illness, and it could be bipolar, it could be schizophrenia, it could be some combination of the two. You know, lockdown is treatment, so she is forced to be seen 24-7. She's forced to interact with people. There's going to be a lot more data. I think the judge was probably right to allow time to factor in so that we can really see what the diagnosis is and what the treatment needs are. And also, Wendy, I imagine that she may reconstitute in treatment, so the conservatorship may ultimately be perhaps less defensible? Well, she may reconstitute, but I think that part of the, the taking the two weeks time is to get any chemicals out of her system so we can see what the symptomology might be separate and aside for how she's been self-medicating. I mean, we, we don't know for sure, but there have been uh, allusions to some drug use and abuse, some marijuana use and potentially Adderall. Um, there have been reports of all kinds of doctor bills, so she may have been doing the rounds, trying to get prescriptions and attempting to help herself along the way. So we've got to get that out of her system, right? Wouldn't you agree? Yes, oh, absolutely. It is either substance with illness or uh, separate from. It's hard to tell what this is because addiction can present as any psychiatric syndrome you can imagine. But this is a typical age when real significant mental illness can develop. So I'm suspicious it may not be substances. We'll see. Candace, your co star, Jody Sweeten, had a major substance abuse problem meth, coke, ecstasy, alcohol. Did the rest of you see this coming? We didn't see it coming at all. It was quite a shock. I mean, I read it along in the newspapers or in the tabloids with everyone else. And, um, you know, she stopped working at 13 years old. So at that point, I think some of the things that were hereditary, that genetically were her makeup, we weren't aware of those things. And, and she didn't show us a clue at that time. And Candace, your thoughts on Amanda? I mean, my my heart as a mom, as an actress, as a woman, it just goes out to her because clearly she's a very talented girl, and uh, you. It, I can't imagine that it's not mental illness. I don't think that being in the industry caused any of this, but when you're in the industry and you have access to everything and a lot of money, uh, it just it, it exaggerates it. It blows it up, and then everyone's there to watch your decline yes. and slide down. Uh, right. Tiffany, I agree 100% with Candace, and For I think sure. the other. Another issue we can all learn here is if you see these things coming, you need to get help early before it does spiral out of control. Would you agree? 
For, I absolutely agree. The problem, Dr. Drew, is there's such a stigma with mental illness in this country that a lot of times people shy away, and especially when you've got a child actor or an actress where they've been coddled for a lot of their lives and told that everything is right, you're perfect, there's nothing wrong with you. It's hard to see that person then reaching out and saying, hey, I have a problem. I'm not doing well. I'm sad. I'm depressed. I, I feel worthless. It's really hard. It's an interesting dichotomy that these these kids now grown-ups find themselves in you know can, uh, Tiffany Candace I want to ask you Tiffany brings up a really interesting point here which is oh, everyone around that child actor she has been so great and so wonderful mm -hmm. they they are invested they want to think of her that way to think of her now as someone with an illness must be extra difficult absolutely and you have to think as a parent did they ever see any signs or do they know their family history extensively could that have been a red flag at some point to think maybe this wouldn't be a safe environment for my child to put them in if I know this is a, we have a history of this. Another really interesting mm. twist on this. That's very interesting point. If you know you have a family history of bipolar disorder, do you allow your kid into this industry? Next up, thank you panel, more on Amanda Bynes and our exclusive interview with her old friend Lance Bass and later. The heartbreaking reality is the Amanda Bynes we see today far different from the little girl who starred in the Amanda show. I want to show you something from the first season 13 years ago. If you're not familiar where she came from, I think you'll be startled. Take a look at this. We brought you a little surprise that'll help you sleep, honey. Indeed. What is it? It's Rock Rockabye Ralph. Ralph. Yeah. Rockabye Ralph. Who's there? It's a doll, sweetie. A doll that'll help you sleep. Squeeze his gut. Okay. I love you. Time to go sleepy. <laughs> Aw, he's so cute. Thanks, Mom. Dad. Now you night, honey. You know, she was my daughter's favorite program. Candace, I wonder if you talk to your children about the Amanda then versus now and what they can learn from this. I, I, I mean, I talk to them uh, only because they, it, it's so all over the news and it's like, Mom, what happened? Um, they didn't grow up with her as much, but they see where she's at now. And all of her, their friends are talking about her. And, you know, again, I can't, I can't blame it on the business, but it just makes me parent on purpose with purpose more and more and tell my kids not to do drugs not to drink not to, to be very grounded and and choose wisely who their friends are at the ages that they're at and it just i, I want to do my best as a parent and, and use candace, her as an example and candace would you have any resistance let's say you found one of your children duct taping the vents in their in their room fearful that somebody was trying to come in and get them would you have any resistance in getting that child to psychiatric care absolutely not absolutely not dr sharp do you have a reaction to that well, I think that's so important, Candace, because a lot of times people who are having unfolding major mental illness are self-medicating with drugs and alcohol. So she could be deteriorating, she could be unraveling, she could be getting detached, and she could be using drugs as a way not to feel that. So we can't assume it's drugs necessarily. You've got to get a proper right. psychopath. I agree. And Wendy, that sort of bothers me that every time somebody behaves peculiar in the media, everyone wants to go to drugs. I'm yes. an addictionologist. I'm ready to go there, but it's not always well, that. <laughs> Well, as you know, that most people who become uh, uh, substance abusers begin because they're trying to self-medicate pain, emotional pain that they're experiencing, psychiatric pain that they're experiencing. And then they sort of try, uh, they feel around the environment to try to get the cocktail of, of drugs that they'll need to affect their well, neurotransmitters. I, let, let me, and of course, it doesn't work. And let me sort of, Tiffany, I'll let you comment on this. I'm going to sort of refine this a little bit. Mm -hmm. In, in my world, that's usually people who have trauma and feel horrible in their own skin. Different, Tiffany, than somebody who's developing a bipolar disorder and it starts messing around with substances. That's really the bipolar disorder right. is the problem. Right, and it usually is coming out of nowhere. If you're talking about that age range, you spoke about it earlier, between 16, 18 to 25 ish, that's when a lot of stress is starting to come into their lives. Maybe they're at school, at college, maybe it's the first time they're being on their own. Maybe it's the first time they've ever had real responsibility in their lives, and it takes a dramatic toll on someone that's predisposed to a bipolar or a schizophrenia or any type of mood or psychotic disorder. And what has to happen for them is something multidisciplinary. It can't be just meds or it can't be just 
best therapy. It's got to be a combination of a lot of different things, psychoeducation, family talk therapy, medication management, support groups, and support groups specifically with other people with similar disorders. I, I, that's, that's so the, important. Listen, you're, 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 Dr. Drew. Who is asking? Candace, I, go. I'd like to just ask a question. What I want to know is how do you try to help a friend? If you're not the parent, they are a legal adult. I face that with Jody. What do you do as a friend when someone doesn't want to receive help? Yeah, it's a, it's a, Dr. That's Trump, I'll tough. go to you to, to, to answer this. But first, I would say, you know, you, you've got to be ready to leave the relationship, in my experience. You use whatever leverage you have, which is other relationship, which is money, which is work, the, the, and notifying the employer, the family, whatever you've got, you're often trying to save somebody's life. But my, Dr. Sharp, my opinion is you also have to be ready to leave that person because sometimes that is what gets through. And by the way, don't forget to use law enforcement, anything else you've got in your hands, if this is a life-threatening problem. Dr. Sharp. Yeah, you've got, to, you've got to model a healthy decision. And that can be an intervention. You can get friends together. That can be going to law enforcement. And that can be walking away. And if I can just make one interesting point, I think, schizophrenic's favorite drug is uh, amphetamines because that causes After hallucinations. After tobacco. So they're trying to... Yeah, after tobacco. So they're trying to gain a sense of control over feeling out of control. So drug abuse in major mental illness is very interesting, very complicated. And let's let's finish this up by saying, you know, Tiffany was mentioning all the stressors that come with being 18 to 22 and living away from home, going to college, that kind of thing, trying to figure out who you are, what you're going to do. But there's something really about the brain development. Is there not the case that seems to cause this to come on in those age groups? But oh, absolutely. And, you know, we're learning more and more about that now in terms of our science. It's clearly a brain disease. Wow. Yeah. Dr. Drew, I have a question for you. Is Sam. she aware, was she aware of her erratic behavior throughout all this? Because this is not the Amanda Bynes that yeah. her friends and family once knew. It's a great question. I think it dovetails on what Candace was asking, and I'll go to, to Wendy to help me out with this, which is that yeah. resistance to treatment, lack of insight, those are hallmarks of major mental illness, and it's a part of substance too, but especially mental illness. Wendy. And remember, when you're f having feelings of paranoia, you really believe them. And you believe that everyone else is completely wrong. And wow. I wanted to add one more thing, Dr. Drew, about these kinds of interventions that you try to do with adults. Remember, you, this is what happened to her, is that they did the things they were supposed to do. And I really want to commend her parents because they're doing everything right here. Um, but, you know, they, they did leave the relationship. And, she, and many of her friends did. And she ended up alone in New York with $4 million of her right. own. So who could stop her? Does yeah. anyone know, was, could have anything been done earlier when we, the, the world, saw on her Twitter account it's, that she yeah. was starting to it's fall apart? It's so easy for us really? to sit and talk right. about that, but you, when you look back in retrospect, it's much easier to see it than if you're a parent not wanting to, you know, it's a parent, we don't want to think our kids are sick, we don't want to see this stuff. I agree with you, Wendy, these parents are doing exactly, exactly what they need to do, and it's likely going to be, it's to benefit Amanda. Now, the judge may not grant them that conservatorship, if that happens, that will probably be because she's responding to treatment and participating, regaining her insight, and becoming the Amanda we all have come to love over the years. Thank you, panel. If anyone out there has a question for the Behavior Bureau, tweet us at Dr. Drew HLN, hashtag Behavior Bureau.